once arrived. And uh, first of all, I'd like to say, if you check the program on the website, I think you've seen Bjorn Wolfsham's name. Uh, am I right? And I, I, as I think you can tell, I'm not Bjorn Wolfsham. Uh, he, he wasn't able to be here for this afternoon. He will join us this evening. My name is Jenny Johannesson, and I'm acting Pro Vice Chancellor at the University of Burås. And I bid you all very warmly welcome to the Days of Knowledge. And this is the third time that we organize this event. It's an annual event to celebrate education and research at the University of Burås. The university, Sparbank Stiftelsen Sjöhärad and Swedbank Borås host the event together. And it's an offshoot from Sparbank Stiftelsen Sjöhärad's traditional gala in which they award prizes within sport, culture and education in the region of Sjöhärad. So this is the third time that we're doing this, but in two ways, at least, this is the first time for all of us. Because as you've also recognized by now, if you didn't see it in the program, is that we're doing this in English. And the reason why we're doing this is that this year, uh, the Days of Knowledge are part of our International Week at the university. And the International Week obviously goes on for a week, uh, and it includes all kinds of events that celebrates and promotes the university's activities activities that in different ways further internationalization. And internationalization is something that is increasingly integrated into all our education and research. And we feel that it's very important that we celebrate this development because we think it furthers the aim of the University of Burås as a whole. So doing this is in English is one way in which it's the first time for all of us. And the, the second way is that for the first time, the Days of Knowledge include also the award, the Social Media Prize. And the Social Media Prize is a grant in the amount of 100,000 Swedish crowns that is financed by Sparbank Stiftelsen Sjöhärad and awarded by Borås City and the University of Borås. The prize is given to a person or people who have made significant achievements in social media from a social development perspective. This year, the prize goes to Wikimedia Sverige. The non-profit Wikimedia Sverige has, for many years, worked to make information available online, mainly on Wikipedia, one of the world's largest free knowledge sources. Wikimedia Sverige conducts a variety of pro projects, including helping instructors and librarians to use Wikipedia. Wikimedia Sverige also supports archives and museums to make their material available. Hundreds of volunteers contribute to Wikimedia Sverige's work in a variety of ways. The official part, the, the, the official prize award, sorry, will be at tonight's dinner, but but now we have the pleasure of listening to a short presentation by Anna Trubay, Head of Operations at Wikimedia Sverige. Anna, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much for letting us be here today and thank you very much for the award. Um, I hear it's very fashionable this year not to acknowledge that you get a great award we are not like that. We are ridiculously happy to achieve this great honor. Um, also, the only prize I ever had the chance to, to come and accept before was an award for shot put when I was 11. So this is a great moment for me and for my organization. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the social media revolution of knowledge. That's a lot of great words in one sentence, but I'm going to explain them a little bit further. First of all, I'm going to talk about the elephant in the room. What is Wikipedia and what is Wikimedia? And are they the same or are they not at all the same? Everybody wants to ask that and we try to answer as best as we can. Uh, I usually say that it's a little bit like the eternal question, who is Bjorn and who is Benny? They kind of look the same, but, you know. Um, Wikipedia is the world's greatest and biggest, and actually also the historically 
biggest and greatest encyclopedia. Wikimedia is the organization that supports Wikipedia. So Wikimedia Foundation in America are the ones that maintain the servers and make sure that the encyclopedia is up and running. But all the content on Wikipedia is completely edited and administered by the community around Wikipedia. And that could be anybody. It could be a few of you here. And if you're not already part of that community, anybody here can become part of that community. And Wikimedia Sweden, we are a local chapter of Wikimedia Foundation. We are our own organization, but we are still a part of that group. And we work with a Swedish language version of Wikipedia, which is uh, actually quite big, considering that Swedish is quite a small language. The Swedish Wikipedia language version is still uh, quite big compared to many others. So you could say that our goal as an organization is to work for free knowledge. We believe that anybody that has access to free knowledge has access to a better life, more open doors, more opportunities. And this is true for everybody, whether you live in Sweden or you live in Bangladesh or you live in India or you live in America or wherever you live. If you have knowledge, you can take steps to further your life in a great many different ways. And our main tool as an organization is, of course, Wikipedia, because it is a wonderful platform for knowledge. But we also have many other platforms that we work with. We work with Wikimedia Commons, for instance. And if you don't know what that is, um, you probably do without knowing it, really. Because if you have been into Wikipedia and you see a picture there, that picture is stored on Wikimedia Commons. It's the file database that is used by Wikipedia, but a, a lot of other organizations and platforms and people all around the world. We also work a lot with Wikidata, which is a place where you can uh, collect uh, different kinds of met metadata that is then feeded into Wikipedia and other places. Because that is our main idea, that all the information that we gather should all always be free and made accessible to as many people in the world as possible because knowledge is there to be shared. So I'm going to let you imagine a little bit. Imagine that you sat here 15 years ago and I told you that I have this great idea. I'm going to have this web page and anybody in the world without even logging in will have the opportunity to change everything on the web page they can delete what other people have done, they can add their own things, they can add pictures, they can add links. Anybody, in a constant change, in a constant flux. And we will have this great encyclopedia, the best thing that we have ever seen. What would you think then? What would you think of me if I had told you that 15 years ago? I tried this with my mother, and she said, well, I think, I would have thought it would have looked something like your room did when you were 14. It would have been a complete mess all the time. However, when a lot of people gather around a great idea and with the expressed will to do good and to help other people, good things happen. And as it goes along, you also see that you can actually trust people. People are, in general, much better than we think. You know, it's, it's fashionable today to uh, look at the people next to you and go like, mm, I probably can't trust them. But that is silly, and Wikipedia is one wonderful example of that. You can put trust in strangers, and you will have a wonderful thing coming out of it. A wonderful thing that I like to call big magic, because it is big magic. I have a lot of numbers. I had to write them down because it's big numbers. The, and this is the result of what happens when good people come together to do good things for other people on a platform online. In 15 years, 40 million articles have been created. In 15 years, 300 different language versions of Wikipedia has popped up. 
half a billion visitors come to Wikipedia worldwide every month. 70,000 people around the world add or take away or edit or put up pictures or whatever on Wikipedia every month. 70,000 people take time out of their every day just because they want to add something to the world, just because they want to help people. And if we take the Swedish numbers, Swedish Wikipedia has about 3 million page views every day. About 3,000 people do something on Wikipedia every month, as in editing or adding or taking away, taking or, you know, adding to the great wealth that is Wikipedia. 800 people do quite a bit on Wikipedia every month. And about 100 are hardcore Wikipedians that do a huge amount of the work, which includes writing, editing what other people have written, also making sure that the platform is developed. What tools do we want to implement on Swedish Wikipedia? Uh, how do we work to get more people to learn how to use it, not only as an encyclopedia, but a place where you can add your knowledge? All of this work, all of the many, many countless hours that it has taken to create 40 million articles and 300 language versions of Wikipedia is done non-profit by people who do it on, in their spare time. It is impossible to put any kind of monetary value on that because it's so much work and therefore it's so wonderful to be able to accept a price like this as a you know, to, to give all these volunteers, you know, a little bit of credit for what, what they do. Uh, I also like to talk about all the volunteers because they are often forgotten. Because when you, like me, watch TV and wonder how old an actor is and you check Wikipedia on your phone, you don't think so much about the person that added the information about the age of that actor. If you want to check what year Rembrandt painted a picture, or if you want to uh, check how many people that live in Borås, or whatever it can be, maybe you don't think about these people that have spent hours making sure that the information gets there, and the other people who make sure that the information is correct. So this is a great opportunity to give a little bit of credit to these people. And under the hood of Wikipedia, if you lift it up, um, that's where the social part is, because this is a social media award. Um, and actually, when we got the award, we were like, oh, but we haven't ta been taking care of our Twitter feed so well, and maybe we should do more on Facebook. And then we realized what I think the jury realized, that Wikipedia is also a social media platform, in a sense. Because if you lift the hood of Wikipedia, if you see beyond only the articles that you read, there is such a huge social activity going on. All of these people that I've been talking to you about and all the 70,000 people around the world, they meet under the hood of Wikipedia and they discuss how do we best express this in the article. Should we split this article in two maybe because it's becoming a little bit too long? Should we change the image here? Um, should we maybe rethink images overall on Wikipedia? Do we really want the images to be the kind of images that they are now? Um, do we want to do something more? All of this is going on under the hood of Wikipedia, and you don't really see it. You can see it if you click the, the discussion page that all Wikipedia articles have. Um, there is a little tab that says discussion, and if you click there, you can see all the discussions that have created that particular article. And most articles have these discussions because even the smallest articles about the smallest of things can create a discussion, can create uh, this social interaction between people that might be sitting on completely different ends of the world, but they have one thing in common, and that is that they want to spread their knowledge to other people. And 
I would like to highlight a few of those volunteers and I'm going to tell you a little bit about them and what they do and how they add to the encyclopedia that you use every day. This here is Albin. He is uh, by day an actor and by night, I almost said not all, always by night, but in his spare time he takes pictures for Wikipedia, pictures that he uploads onto Wikimedia Commons. He has taken thousands and thousands of pictures. Um, he is mostly known in Wikipedia, in the Wikipedia context, because he has taken many thousands of pictures from the, the previous year's Eurovision. So if you go onto Wikipedia and you find pictures from, I think, the three latest Eurovisions, you will find a lot of pictures. If you click into Wikimedia Commons, you will find thousands of Albin's pictures. They've been used in traditional media all around the world. Uh, the last time I talked to him, he was happy. He had found an article in an online magazine from, I think it was Taiwan. And he was like, they had my picture. And that is possible because he wants to do this the Eurovision people were happy to invite him, as, a part, as, as they would invite any other member of the press. It's possible because he publishes his picture under a Creative Commons license, which makes it possible for anybody to use it. This paper in Taiwan could use it. They didn't have to contact him. They found a great picture, they were happy to publish it, and they put his name on it. So that's one really good example of what one person can do. Here's a few others. Magnus up in the corner, he also takes pictures and he writes a lot for Wikipedia. He helps us out in the office with everything. He helps us to educate new Wikipedians. He even helped us assemble our office furniture because we didn't have the time to do that and he was happy to come and help us do that. Bengt in the middle, he is on our board. He also writes a lot. This time he was at an arts and feminism writing workshop that was hosted by a museum in Stockholm. Jonathan on the side here, he is one of our really young volunteers. He is 18. He started quite a few years ago, so he's been an active Wikipedian for a long time. This picture is taken in Italy. Uh, where there was a big Wikipedia and Wikimedia conference uh, that he went to to meet other Wikipedians from all over the world. He helps a lot when we have those writing workshops. He comes and helps us educate new and interested Wikipedians. He uploads pictures to Wikimedia Commons. He has helped us with a couple of projects where we have been doing that. This smiling group over here uh, it's a group from um, the other Wikimedia people, is Lennart and Sophie. They are in Gothenburg. This summer, they arranged a Wikipedia camp for women because we have too few women on Wikipedia. We have too few articles about women on Wikipedia. We have too few women writing on Wikipedia. And you can complain about that or you can do something. And Lennart and Sophie called our office and said, you know what, we have this idea. We want to create a camp for so we can teach women to write on Wikipedia. And they had all sorts of great plans, and we said, of course, because that's one of the many things we do as an organization. We try to support all the, all the ideas that come from the community. If they want to do something, it could be a wiki camp, or it could be a wiki workshop, or a wiki coffee. Anything that makes people meet, discuss wiki things, and add to our common knowledge database, we are happy to support. And that was one, one of those things. And several of these ladies here have continued to writing on Wikipedia, and they are very involved, and they want to do more. And if Lennart and Sophie gets their way, which I can say that they will, um, they will have two camps like this next year. And this is only because individuals decide that we want to add to this, we want to be a part of this, and we want you to be a part of it as well, so let's do this. And we make it happen. And this, I said that the picture of Jonathan was taken in Italy. 
This is Esino Lario. It's a very small village in Italy. It has 600 inhabitants. Apart from one week this year, when they were suddenly flooded with a thousand Wikipedians from all over the world, I think there was over 40 nationalities. And all of these people here are just like the, the ones I just showed you. All of these people do the same things, but in their countries, and quite a few of them in, in Sweden, because there was quite a large number of Swedish Wikipedians there. Um, I talked to one girl from Egypt. She was 22 years old, and I asked, hey, is this your first Wikimania? And she was like, no, 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 I've been to many. I, I have convinced two universities in my home countries that they should let their graduate students add it to Wikipedia as part of their courses. She was 22, and she has managed to persuade two universities to change the way they work so they could add more information that anybody in the world could access. I think that's pretty amazing. I don't think I would have done that when I was 22. And all of, there's just as many stories as there are people in this picture. So the next time you are at a IKEA or in front of the TV and you check something on Wikipedia, these are the people that made it possible. These are the people that help you know how old Brad Pitt is or whatever it is you want to check. But there is another layer to this. As I said in my first example, when I wanted you to imagine if I had suggested a thing, an impossible thing like Wikipedia 15 years ago, there, there is, of course, a certain resistance it takes time before something kind of grows and gets accepted and trusted, because trust is a big, important thing when it comes to information. And we, in Wik for Wikimedia Sweden, we have been working for many years trying to gain that trust from universities, from institutions, schools, libraries, museums. And in the beginning, it was something of an uphill battle. But there are so many in individuals in these organizations that are very curious and they want to try new things. And they have information that they want to share. So through this, these first careful contacts, we managed to find these people and we started to build from that. And today we have a lot of projects together with, well, as I said, libraries, museums, schools, universities all sorts of places want to work with us because they have information that they want, want to get out there and we can help them do that. And here are a few examples. Uh, the planes, for instance, are pictures from uh, the Air Force Museum in Linköping. The picture of Queen Christina in the corner is from National Museum. And National Museum just recently, just a couple, like last week, uh, released another 3,000 pictures free on Wikimedia Commons with our help. And there are many museums in the world that do this. British Museum does it, Rijks Museum in Amsterdam does it. It is happening everywhere. We have this picture in the corner. Those are the first tourists on top of a mountain in Sweden somewhere. And it's a picture from the Nordic Museum's collections. It's one of the many pictures that they have released. We have wiki workshops once a month in Stockholm in cooperation with Stadsbiblioteket. We have cooperations with schools where we have students uh, writing uh, in their home language on those language versions. We have uh, this wonderful weapon up there. I don't know if you can see it. It's actually a pistol axe. So it's both a pistol and an axe, what we all need in our everyday life. Um, that comes from uh, the collections at School Cluster. They have also released a huge amount of information and pictures and metadata to us. Uh, and the picture up in the corner is from a project we did together with the Genesfotografen, Thomas Gunnarsson. Um, because there are some problems on Wikipedia, even if it is absolutely fantastic, that sometimes the pictures can be a little bit sexist, they need, are a little bit too sexualized when they don't need to be, and all those things. And we thought like, okay, how do we approach this? Number one, we needed knowledge. So we contacted Thomas because he has that knowledge. 
and we started a project where we said, okay, fine, we'll create pictures. We create better pictures because we realized that if you want to illustrate an article about legs or hands or something, it's actually very hard to make good choices because if you want to have a picture of a hand, it will always be, the pictures you'll find will always be the picture of a white man's hand. It will probably not be a woman's hand. It will most likely not be from someone colored. If you want pictures of a leg, it will probably be a white man's leg or a woman's leg in a high-heeled shoe or something, which is also like, yeah, well, that's not really just an anatomical picture. So together with Thomas, we created a collection of pictures that were not like that. We created a collection of pictures that was outside the norm, and we wanted to give that to the community so they, to make it easier for them to make good choices and make Wikipedia better that way. We also had uh, trans people taking part of this because they are also quite badly rep represented um, and we wanted to create good pictures that could be used uh, for very many different kinds of groups. We also had a, like a woman who's in a wheelchair and stuff like that because you, we need more free accessible pictures to use. And of course, we work with many, many more things, but those are a few of the things that we do. We also work with Wikispeech, which is a speech synthesis to make uh, Wikipedia accessible for people that can't read for one reason or another. They will be able to have a Wikipedia spoken to them. Um, we are working with Open Connected Heritage, which is a project to save, um, or at least save in some form uh, threatened cultural heritage around the world because cultural heritage is very threatened. It can be threatened by war, like in Syria, for instance. It can be threatened by environmental issues or just time. Things don't last. Um, but if you take pictures of them, if you save information, at least you have something left of them. Uh, and we're in the middle of that project, but we started with about 2,000 pictures from old pictures from Palmyra. And those are all things that basically do not exist anymore. Um, but they are there in pictures and anybody can see them on Wikimedia Commons and Wikipedia. So I've already touched a little bit on, I've told a lot about how good Wikipedia is and I've touched a little bit on the things where we need to be better. But as you can see, in 15 years, we have managed to hopefully make the word a little bit better we have hopefully opened many new doors for people that maybe did not have that many open doors before. And we are very happy about that and we will of course continue to do that, but we also have to address certain challenges that we have. And I think mainly we have two challenges that we need to approach now um, to maintain trust and to continue to be a relevant part in, of the world. Um, and it is we need to think about the whole word, because if you look at the people that are writing on Wikipedia today, there is a, the, the by far largest group come from the Western world. And we want to bring in people from all countries in the world. And, and there are, of course, people in all countries, but we want to have many, many, many more. Because there is so much knowledge out there that we need to have, and that we all should share. Um, so we in Wikimedia Sverige and also in other local Wikimedia chapters and from the Wikimedia Foundation, we work a lot with trying to support uh, people who want to work with Wikipedia all around the world. And we will continue to do that because that is important. Because the, we are writing history on Wikipedia. We are telling the story of our time for future generations. And it shouldn't only be a certain kind of people's history of our time. We want to have a lot of different voices. We want to have a lot of different perspectives so we can pass on a much more full, uh, full view of our lives and, and, and our time. And the same goes for women. Today, um, there is about 10% of the editors on Wikipedia are women. It's a little bit hard to say that number very definitive because some people don't uh, indicate what, what gender they are. Um, but 
to the best of our knowledge, it is about 10%. And that is very little. We need more women to write. And um, we work a lot with that. We work with our wiki workshops. We work with uh, the institutions that we work with. They are also very interested in, in this because they usually have the same problem. I mean, we want to be an equal society, but we are really not. Um, so they have the same problem. So by working together, we can bit by bit try to make it a little bit better. Um, and I think these two challenges we need to address and we are addressing them now, but we want to do it even more. Uh, and in doing so, we will make Wikipedia even better. Um, I have been given my, my little signal here that I should quit in a couple of minutes. Uh, but I would like to ask all of you to spend five minutes in the coming week or, or so, or during the weekend, and have a look at Wikipedia and click on all those tabs that you normally don't click on. Click on the discussion page. Click on create an account even. It might look a little bit hard in the beginning, but it actually isn't. There are very many Wikipedians there that will help you. And if you do the wrong thing, it's Wikipedia, you can change it. The worst thing that can happen is that someone gets a little bit annoyed with you and goes like, oh, but you should have known that. But then you tell them, no, I'm new and you have, please help me. And they will. Because all of these people that I've been showing you here in the pictures and many, many, many more are just sitting there waiting for people just like you to come and join them in, spre and in spreading this knowledge revolution around the world because it changes people's life. And when I started editing, I realized that it doesn't only change people's life, as in everybody else's life, it actually changes your own life. You get a completely new view on things. You get a new view on sharing, and you get a new view and interest, I would say, in the world. Because everything is suddenly much more interesting when you are faced with something and you go like, oh, can I write something about this on Wikipedia? It adds a different level to things. So, Try that for five minutes, or contact us, and we can see if we can help you and your organization in any way. And you will make life a little bit better for someone else, and in the process, you will hopefully make your own life even better. Thank you very much. Thank you, Anna. I, I think you highlighted the theme of the Days of Knowledge very nicely in several ways. I actually thought towards the end that you were going to quote our Nobel Prize winner, Bob Dylan. The times are, they are changing, right? <laughs> they are. Yeah. But I think what you also described is that we have several similarities, Wikimedia, mm. Wikipedia and universities. Absolutely. Because you, when you described your main challenges, mm. I could recognize all of them. Mm. Uh, we have to become, you already are, but you have to maintain to be still internationally truly relevant. We have to increase our efforts there as a university, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, you also described that we have to maintain a level of trust. Yes. And I think this is also very important for, for mm -hmm. universities. Mm -hmm. And n not least, we have to increase the amount of women who are active in uh, universities as well. So even though we have different ways of producing and promoting mm -hmm. and disseminating knowledge, uh, I think that it's very good that we're working together w because we seem to have several common goals also. Oh, I think so, and we do actually, we overlap quite often. I mean, we do work with universities, so there is, mm -hmm. we have slightly different roles, but we can, you know, there's an overlap that we can work with. Yeah, and I use Wikipedia quite a lot already, so. Uh, <laughs> You're already so hooked. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Yeah, you will you. be with us for the rest of the day and during the indeed. evening also, so you can pester her then. Absolutely. Uh, Thank you so much, Anna. A warm round of applause yeah, again, you. I think. Thank you. And yeah, to, yeah, thanks. Uh, so now we turn to, to a different aspect of sustainable development, I would say, because that, that is also a very important red thread, sorry for that, Clemens, running through uh, the days of knowledge, I would say. And uh, the next part of our event is a panel discussion, panel conversation, on sustainable fashion that has also been furthered by Sparbank Stifters and Sjöhärad, a grant from them. Uh, so I welcome up on stage Katarina Midby, who is a sustainability manager at Hennes Maritz. 
I also welcome Mariko Takahashi. Uh, sorry if the pronunciation was wrong. I, uh, Mariko is an international guest designer at the Swedish School of Textiles here in Bors. And finally, Clemens Tonqvist is a professor at the Swedish School of Textile, and he will chair and moderate this session on sustainable fashion. And I leave you in his competent hands. Thank you. Thank you. So to introduce this panel discussion, we thought that uh, Marco and Katarina uh, will make a short introduction to their perspectives uh, so you can get a, a better understanding from where they come from as well. So, and I believe Katarina will start. Okay, well thank you very much. And nice to be here. Hi everyone, and good afternoon. So I am a sustainability manager at H&M and I have worked at H&M for about 13 years. Now I have a background in fashion journalism. Uh, and joined H&M as the head of PR. Then I worked with our seasonal trends together with the designers and that's where we started up our conscious collection. And since then I've been working with sustainability. It's very interesting and very exciting. And uh, it's also an increasing, um, uh, increasingly important value. It's actually one of our core values at H&M, sustainability. And we also updated our brand vision, which has been the same since 1947 to offer fashion and quality at the best price. Now we also want to offer fashion and quality at the best price in a sustainable way. And uh, our sustainability vision is to lead the change towards a circular and renewable fashion industry while being a fair and equal company. And this is a vision that was um, developed this year, actually. So we've just launched our new sustainability strategy uh, which is very bold uh, and kind of sets the commitment and the mindset of ourselves and also us working uh, towards our uh, suppliers and partners and stakeholders. And it is uh, to be 100% circular and uh, renewable, to be 100% fair and equal and to be 100% leading the change. And of course 100% is not possible today, but we figured it's better to set the goal and then work towards it. So that's what we're doing right now, very excitingly so. Um, this means that sustainability is integrated into everyone's work processes. It's, um, it's really important in your everyday work, whatever you do at H&M. And we all need to be educated and engaged and also we're actually very proud of working at H&M because we take this responsibility and we know that we will always make the right choice one of the reasons for that, I think, is that we have uh, we are partly family-owned. Uh, so obviously, our current CEO is the grandson of uh, of the founder, Alin Pashon. So for him, of course, also the company has a future. It's not only about the short-term profits and the present. Uh, yeah, we will discuss a lot about this later on. But also, what uh, from our perspective, we also uh, often hear that yes, but you uh, buy such large volumes and you contributes to so much consumption around the world. And yes, we do, but we also want to use our scale and size for positive change, which we can, especially in the production, company, uh, production countries where we produce, uh, where we uh, empower women through work uh, development, where we um, provide a better infrastructure in the countries thanks to the textile industry exports where we uh, work uh, together with the governments, with the trade unions, with the factory owners for better working conditions and fair living wages for all the textile workers and so on. So um, for me, it's a really positive thing to work at H&M uh, because it's such a, with sustainability because it's such a big company because we can really make a difference. And that's the kind of excitement of it all. But also, of course, together with the industry, big and small. I think that was my five minutes. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I want to. Yeah. Okay. So, I believe this is my turn. And um, I think most of you don't know who I am and why I am sitting here. So, I will introduce briefly about me. And my name is Mariko Takahashi. And this is my colleague, Eugenia Schmidt, and we make the company Scott Schmidt Takahashi. And um, it's 
just our last name put together. And Schmidt Takahashi is a fashion brand. Um, we are working since 2010, approximately. And uh, we are based in Berlin. And the special thing about our brand is we're collecting used textiles, mostly garments from various individuals and using them as material to create new collections. And I introduce a little bit our process. We collect the garment directly, mostly from individuals. Um, and the important thing that we collect directly is because we provide a little ID number for the donation. And this enables the donor to follow, if they want to, what happens with their used garments. And the process is pretty chaotic since we accept almost everything except underwear or socks or any stuff like that. But um, we get all sort of different garments. And we register everything, every single piece in our database with its information and uh, what kind of garment it is and materials, colors, and, and um, origin, if we can find out. And then we put everything in our database with the number which, provide, which we provide to the donor. And we use these garments as a starting point to, to develop our collections. And we use uh, various techniques and we experiment a little bit and this is the most interesting part for us to think what can we do with this given garments. And I show a couple of examples. We do collections for men and women each season. So spring, summer and autumn, winter. And we create with this uh, given garments new, new design. And we, p with the important thing with what we do, uh, because we provide these numbers to the customers and at the end we want to link them together with the product we made and um, we put everything, uh, the connection between what is used in this each finished product and put a little sticker with uh, this QR code, which is uh, linked to the information what is contained in each product. And, and also with the number which is attached on the product, uh, you can also see what, what, what uh, was it before. And this is somehow the screenshot how it looked like on the web page. And the we created this model or a system at the beginning, um, and uh, this is our vision that we collect used garments and then put new materials if it's necessary, and then uh, create new collection. and And ideally, it's will it will come back to our uh, our donation box, and then um, the idea is we're adding value to each each cycle with design and the the story which is given into each um, each cycle and this is uh, somehow what we've been doing the last five six years and um, and it is of course not the ultimate perfect solution for all the garments which exist because we are just two designers and relatively small capacity and resource. Um, but um, yes, and um, sometimes we are a little bit, we feel a little bit limited with our capacities, but um, uh, the, and 
then beginning of this year, I was given the opportunity to come to this uh, the Swedish School of Textiles and uh, had a little time to think about more um, from the distance, from the uh, everyday business routine, uh, what is sustainable fashion and as start asking again questions about this subject. And I think um, I will stop my introduction for the first, uh, for the further discussion. Thank you, uh, and yeah. thank you for the introductions. I mean, I think it's very privileged to have you both here because you represent two different uh, key players, but from very different positions in the market and in, in, in the in the fashion industry. And I wanted to start by. Um, Looking at uh, um, writings, rankings, etc., H&M uh, uh, comes a lot of time up as a top company in terms of um, sustainable efforts and and and, uh, and what you do, and also in comparison to other similar sized structured companies glo with globally well known. So I'm um, quite interesting. What 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 do you think? What's the difference? How come you you come so high in these? What, what yeah, I mean, I guess we, we our results are really good when it comes to sustainability um, uh, facts and, you know, and, and the different actions and, and uh, results we have. But uh, the reason why we are so committed to sustainability, I think, is uh, firstly, we are a Swedish company. We have sustainability in our genes, in our bones. We all grow up in Sweden. We have all man's right. You know, we're used to taking care of nature. We believe in helping helping each other. We believe in people. It's um, I think it's pretty you know it's like what we say sunt fornuft or common sense. Mm -hmm. It's simply it's simply the right thing to do. And I think also uh, to follow up on what I mentioned previously about um, uh, also our management that we are run by a family-owned company and that uh, the company has a history, but it also has a future and. Uh, I think that makes a big difference that we don't make the, the fast, the most short-term profitable solutions, but we would rather always, I, during my experience at least, we will always make the right decision, even if it hurts and even if it costs. Um, we will still do it because it's the right thing to do. So you think uh, family ownership could be uh, an important, significant thing for... I think so, and I think also the Swedish... Uh, common sense, if you like. I think also the, the way we are brought up here. Uh, we, are, we do care very much about nature if you compare to other countries, mm -hmm. I think. Well, it's something which is quite familiar if I look at a lot of fashion students and also fashion education from where I come from, that, that these issues are very much sort of um, on the daily table, so to say, that in relation to maybe in other, in other places. But yeah, maybe mm -hmm. it could be a, mm -hmm. uh, an issue. I was thinking um, also, that, I mean, the, one of the reasons why I was quite intrigued by, by what you do in your company as well is that in the earlier books that were gathering uh, and giving examples of, uh, of different redesign uh, collections and, and clothing, etc., you stood out a bit in your design. So the expressions and uh, how your clothing looked like. And I think at that time, now of course it might look a bit different, but at that time, um, in the initial stage when people redid t-shirts or uh, you, you soon found yourself in a certain kinds of expression if you thought of, of, of redesign and of course Magella and other had also of course an impact of reconstruction meant etc also expression wise. Uh, wh why can you, can you elaborate a bit on, on what differentiates your design from others you think? What's the yeah, um, yeah, we were first uh, designers, or we, stud we start studying design and when we were interested in aesthetics at the beginning, and then we start to get aware of this sustainability. So we can't do anything more than design. We are just uh, determined to do the best thing we can do. So, um, and it's always for us it's fascinating what the clothes are what we get the 
the donation from people and then we observe the giving clothes and there is always some inspiration already in the clothes itself so we don't get inspiration from forest or jungle or something else but it's uh, just it tells a lot of story if we see a lot of various things and this diversity it, which is fashion it's uh, it's an imp inspiration for our aesthetic so i don't know if that f is so, so what you're saying is that it's more of, of interrogating the resources and see what's really possible with with that available resource rather than having a, an idea in the beginning that what you would like to do and then fit somehow the resources into into that form or garment or yeah it's just uh, maybe another approach or another method to create new aesthetic but um, but already a lot of designers have been done this this um, method like Margiela and um, many other designers mm. also new designers and um, yeah it's just a different approach you you see what's in your refrigerator and then start to think what you what's the best you can make out of your given materials or something and you don't go and you don't make the shopping list and go get the materials and before you see what you already have and then try to do something exciting out of it so it's uh, but design is always uh, it's uh, more exciting if you have this kind of i don't know like uh, the like a uh, rule or it's like a game which has some sort of structure and rules so if we have this structure from the beginning it's for us it's more convenient to be creative mm. Mm. and you, you touch a lot on on the resources and how it works and i think that's also i mean resources is a key issue here obviously uh, do you um katarina also i mean how is there a different way of approaching the organization of resources do you see uh, also I'm thinking in terms of uh, circularity and um, yeah, new ways of thinking of the business and the systems, etc. Mm. Um, is the organization of resources, is that something that needs to be changed somehow or is that a key element and what, what could that yeah. possibly mean then? Or no, absolutely. No, we, have, we run a, a global garment collecting uh, program where we collect used garments, clothes, textiles and shoes in our stores. And then um, we recycle them for uh, rewear, reuse or recycle. So basically into um, vintage or second hand or charity. Uh, and then also to reuse, which means that we make new products like cloths, cleaning cloths, insulation for houses and cars. And also uh, we, uh, we, we actually recycle into new fibers and new yarn and new fabric and new clothes. So a small part of our collection is actually made from the post-consumer waste that comes into uh, our stores on a bit daily basis in all our stores around the globe. Um, Are these in all so all over the world? All over the world, yeah. yeah, all over the world. Uh, we have these garment collecting boxes in every single store. Mm. So you can come in as a, yeah, you can hand in from any brand and in any condition and in return as an incentive, which we think really works, although it's also a little bit contradictory because of course that will kind of maybe also uh, encourage customers to come back to us, but it has to work so far. We give them a discount voucher for the next purchase. So you hand in your own clothes and you, you get a discount for your next purchase. And for us it's great. We collaborate with a company called iCollect uh, and they have sorting plants around the world. Um, the closest one to here is in Berlin. So I was just saying to <laughs> Michael that it would be great if, if uh, because you can actually order from this sorting plant according to your needs. So we are also working a little bit with upcycling together with students at the London College of Fashion, for instance, we make uh, upcycling competitions every year. But uh, for something like this, this would also be really interesting, of course. So yes, part of our collection is made from, uh, from um, 
upcycled textile, or not really recycled textile, because upcycling is obviously something else, it's what you do. But, uh, and the, the goal is, of course, that we should have uh, more and more. 20% uh, mm -hmm. of our collection now is made from more sustainable materials, which means recycled, organic, FSC certified, or DSL. Uh, but the goal is that we should have 100%. It's not a time-bound goal. We have a time-bound goal for cotton, for instance, that all our cotton should be sustainably sourced by 2020. But when it comes to the whole collection, we still need some time, because even if we really wanted to, we couldn't really um, produce the whole collection out of sustainable materials uh, right now, because there simply isn't enough sustainable materials to, to buy. And, uh, and in such a future with, with everything sort of recycled, uh, I mean, it seems then the collectors and the sorting um, companies or organizations, whatever you want to call them, they seem to be key somehow. So will they replace or become, take a part of the traditional producers? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I know you also have problems. So, I mean, it's great for you, I guess, with the with the, the Berlin connection. But I know in, in your, particularly in your collection, that even if you want to have completely recycle all of the garments is impossible in the end because y you lack you can't simply find the resources to do that mm -hmm. mm. yeah we add always uh, additional materials like zippers and buttons and, and everything which we want to make sure that the quality and everything works and also some part of garments w are worn more than other parts so we have to replace them and put new materials and and we want to make this product somehow appealing and desirable for the new purchase so so we can't avoid having new materials and and using resource but um, yeah is there a lot of initiatives in in, in sorting companies or, or um how does it look? Is, is it developing or, or is it m easier now than it was five years ago to find these things? Or Recycled yeah. materials. They, yeah, for example, there are a lot of recycled buttons. It's made out of papers or some wood materials. which, you, And there are more and more new products like the accessories and and small parts of for the garment production, but I don't know if the product producers are really keen to make and develop this alternative to the already existing thing because mm. I don't know if um, we use them also. Actually, we we see that lately we have uh, because we have a collection that we call Conscious Exclusive where we experiment a little bit with the new materials and new new kind of innovations in the industry. And there we see that now we can find, um, for instance, uh, recycled embellishments, so there are sequins and pearls and, and uh, also zips and things. But it's still very small scale, so we couldn't make it for the whole collection. But it's, it seems like more and more people are asking for it. And when the big companies obviously ask for them, you know, yeah. we, they had to start making them in yeah. scale. So it's, uh, I think I'm sometimes jealous of bigger companies because if if bigger company comes and it get like show the interest that they want more more alternatives to the existing products and then the producer will get more interested and keen to develop so yeah. but then it's also good for you so yeah i think you yeah, have yeah. To collaborate <laughs> I think that's the whole thing about sustainability. You can't really do it alone. Whether you're small or big, you know, yeah. you have to kind of do it as an industry. Yeah. And this was something that was struck me quite clearly when we when I've been in Berlin and I went to some of the stores that, that sell. That they are very helpful. They have produced. You mean they produce map to each other's stores. So so the traditional thing that now of course you should come to my store it here the, is that a new start of uh, is that a small example of a new way of a new networks so a new collaboration that we need to see yeah. new uh, you need to make friends not in a traditional yeah. vertical or horizontal but in other ways is yeah that a yeah in sense of material sourcing it's really practical to have more designers or more stores who are willing to have 
same materials or similar things because then we don't buy everything in like a big bulk so the the producer would don't don't listen to us if just one designer come and ask and then another week comes another designer but when we get together and then think about what we need all together and and then put the order I put gather the order of some certain materials and then it will work sometimes and and also uh, for the customers when we gather information and then provide provide more information for the for the consumers and then it's also easier to navigate um, the the stores and brands in the city if people are get interested yeah I mean, as a designer and, and with a small company, you have, I think, a lot to say and you can make the decisions. I wonder how does it look in, in your organization uh, uh, where design is, is one department out of, out of many. Uh, what can I, as, a, as an ambitious uh, designer coming to the design department, what, how can I affect, what decisions can I, can I make? Where is the decisions on the... You can make every decision, uh, about 80% of the decisions you can make in the design process. Mm -hmm. And what we did when we started up the Conscious Collection is that we made sure that everyone, every single member of the design team had a kind of an education about what they could do within their work process when it came to sustainability. So um, obviously the design team is your designer, you have the design assistant and then you have your buyer, you have the control, you have the pattern cutter, the print designer, uh, did I forget anyone? the material source, that's how we work at H&M at least. And we will have a, obviously everybody can contribute to the sustainability value of the garment. So at first the designer of course has to think about the design longevity. But then, I get, then again, I think that since I started, I began my career back in 1987 working in fashion magazines and then it was still very much about short term trends. You know, one trend would be totally in or out from one season to another. Whereas today it's more about personal styles. So we see that we have kind of built our own um, kind of ongoing fashion. We work along four different categories, you can say, at H&M. Um, and we see that our customers kind of shop from all these different categories and create their own style, which has more longevity. And then, of course, it's about quality, you know, uh, providing quality and also making sure that you can, that you choose material that doesn't have to be dry cleaned because that obviously has a lot of impact on the environment. So apart from maybe outerwear and tailoring, we try to make everything as hand washable or machine washable as possible. And then we also try to encourage our customers to care for their clothes in a more sustainable way. We have, for instance, uh, implemented a new wash care label called clevercare.info uh, on all our wash care labels, so where it shows how you can reduce your climate impact through the user phase with more than 50% through lowering the temperature, avoiding tumble drying, washing less and so on. So those are the things that kind of you can do on a, as a designer. Then I would say, of course, we, we are cost conscious at all times. So we have minimum waste uh, of the, during the pattern cutting process. Then it's also, of course, the material sourcer has to use a material that is uh, maybe more sustainable and also maybe less transportable, although transport is a very small part of the climate Im impact of a life cycle of a garment at H&M is only about 2-3%. But uh, all these things add up when you have large volumes like us. So, so it's, um, yeah, and also the print designer you have to be creative, but you also have to make sure that it's a pattern that uh, that works with time, so that it's you know you can wear it for a long time. And uh, yeah, did I forget anyone? And then of course the controller has his or her job. But it's yeah, we can all add and and eighty percent of the decisions that decide a, cli a garment's climate impact uh, are decided in the design process. So you can do yeah loads. Do you get any list of sort of dust and don'ts? Please don't use this color or this, um, I don't know, nuance. So don't, we don't want to have this wash because that will sort of take too much or too little or... No, we have it pretty. I mean, the, when it comes to the... We had a 
that, that, this was before I joined H&M, but H&M uh, in, in back in 1995 created a collection called Nature Calling in very swinglish, um, uh, made of organic cotton. And then that was before we had a chemical restrictions list, for instance. So then the materials looked very kind of uh, drab and, you know, it was, I think we had rust and petrol and beige and, and the materials were very stiff and so on. Today you can make almost anything of, uh, of more sustainable materials, so it's not really a, you don't really have a, any restrictions when it comes to sustainability today. It's just kind of knowing what you're doing and using your common sense, I guess. But I think it, a lot of it has also to do with design longevity, because that is ultimately the, the solution to to a more sustainable user phase, that you use your clothes for a longer time. And, and do you think a lot of that, uh, I mean, you mentioned the consumer before, and, and, and I know there's also a lot, of, there are more and more efforts in educating or, yeah, well, educating mm. the consumer of how to, to deal with the, with the garments, since mm. that has a huge impact. Mm. Um, do you see that as a, also as a, important strategy to, to Absolutely. develop as well. When we started uh, to work with what we call the conscious collection, we we um, we had to learn. We did. We hadn't really worked with sustainability before in the design process. So we so we um, we asked a company called the Business for Social Responsibility to create a life cycle for us, where it showed where the greatest climate impact was uh, in a in the total of a life cycle of a garment. So if you take from the fiber production through to the user phase. And then of course, uh, there's a lot of climate impact in the fiber production, not least because we use so much cotton and cotton obviously is a really uh, chemical heavy um, crop to, to grow unless you grow organic cotton or better cotton from the better cotton initiative. And then also you have all the different stages of the manufacturing and the fabric production and so on and the transport and the packaging and so on. But the biggest part of all that is actually the user phase. So that's 30% of the total uh, uh, life cycle uh, climate impact of an average garment. Uh, so then of course we felt that yes, and which is why we developed this new wash care label called Clever Care, which is in all our garments and also in the other, not only at H&M, but also in Weekday and Cross and other stores and so on. And also with other brands, uh, wash care labels, because we developed it together with the, with the owners, or with the, the company that owns the wash care symbols. They're called Genetex, it's a Swiss company. So all their licenses can now use this wash care symbol. So we figure if, if we all wash and care for our clothes in a more sustainable way, it's going to make a huge difference mm. if we all cut down on 50% of that usage, since it is 30% of the total. It would make an enormous difference. I, I wish I could calculate how much, because that would really kind of be very satisfying <laughs> to see, but mm. I don't think we can. And then also, of course, we, have, uh, we also wanted to make sure that we don't um, cause any more textiles to landfill. Uh, because ultimately you will grow tired of your clothes and all the unwanted garments. Uh, we know that 11,000 tons of textiles go to landfill in, in, in America every year, for instance. So we started our global garment collecting initiative back in 2012. We had a pilot year in Switzerland, and then we launched it globally in 2013. And since then we have uh, gathered uh, 36,000 tons of textiles around the world. So we've dug up at least America th <laughs> during the last three, <laughs> three years. So that is, uh, that, uh, and we are gathering more and more because we're also communicating much more about it now. And we see also that customers are, they're interested in kind of doing their part and, and um, communicating sustainability is hard, but when you engage customers and when they can participate and, and kind of um, uh, consume more sustainably themselves, it's also a way to, or ourselves, because I'm also a consumer, of course. It's also a great way of engaging mm. or upcycling. I think that would also be great if we could kind of inspire our, this is what we're trying to do with our collaboration with the London College of Fashion, but maybe you can help us to also yeah. inspire them further on how to kind of, how to upcycle your garment, because there's so much you can do also with w what you already have. Yeah. How do you think in terms of communication uh, of, of your uh, designs and your, your brands, uh, is there, do you need to communicate differently, you think? With the, I mean, there's always a debate, should we say, should we point at it, uh, should it be sort of just you know, take it for granted, etc. How, how do you? Mm, since 
we are designers and we, we at the first line, we try to communicate what's our design and aesthetic and, and the products and, and we don't have the um, sustainable department in our company, so we are not very good at communicating with you are the department <laughs> <laughs> with words and and talking but um, we well, one thing I I try to do with the design is that uh, su suggesting how how you can or with design we can also demand a little commitment how people people use the garment or something like that. Mm. That it's not so really easy just to buy and then and look nice with the clothes and putting on and then and then the next uh, day you put something else or some and then um, yeah so um, as individual designer we can we we can communicate with the with how the clothes and product itself is and can be used. So, yeah. I mean, in terms of use and wash, which is then uh, a key thing here, is it possibility to design? Can you design a garment in a certain way that you can wear it longer before I don't know, feeling dirty or before feeling the need for wash it? Are there any are there any ways through the product design to yeah, it's interesting. But I can imagine if we we have this aesthetic that it's uh, we show that the the fabric is already worn and and used by other people, and maybe and we also communicate that it's uh, for us it's important that you see that it's upcycled, and it's not it's different from from new new materials, and so automatically it's it's natural that it looks a little bit used and washed and and uh, it exists longer um, already so maybe people don't care so much about being perfect uh, ironed and and staying free yeah I mean, it's interesting because uh, there's what uh, so in, in the end you think in order to I mean one part of the communi communication or the promotion of sustainable clothing might also be that they look differently or they do do, do you think they do you think they need to have a different language do they need to have a different style or I mean small or le or, or big but do we need to get used to different ways of combining garments or or even seeing different or new types of garments, or just sort of changed garments. But do they need to look differently? You think in order also to promote different behaviors? And uh yeah, I think uh, that's also the important or the privilege to be an independent designer that we can put this forward that we what we want to do and what we want to promo promote how people behave and and uh, interact with garments and uh, we can make garments a little bit uncomfortable or a little bit difficult to combine or something like that which is not very usual thing to do like um, putting everything so that it's very easy to use and, and user friendly, but um, yeah, it's uh, it's somehow it doesn't c it doesn't maybe have directly to do with sustainability, but uh, a little bit uh, like um, we can also demand the user their commitment, how they can be dressed and look inspiring and, and interesting somehow or different than, than everyone else. 
Uh, I know you've also been working on, uh, on con some construction systems here, so diff new ways of, of better using uh, sc scrap materials. Uh, I think. Yeah. Can you, can you ex tell a bit about that? Yeah, um, in the time when I was here in this school, I was uh, researching about how we can um, how can we use waste or avoid waste in two different approach. And one is we, as small designer brand, uh, are producing a lot of um, a lot of clothes which nobody can wear because the size is wrong or the color is wrong or, or, yeah, something is not just right for this, this very customer. So that is also waste or the like waste of work or waste of production. And uh, the other thing is there are a lot of oh, waste coming from the production or also uh, after use we what we already have we can't afford to use everything and every tiny bits of scrap fabrics from our production uh, into another product and it gets smaller and smaller so how can can we use this uh, this as um, material or inspiration for for a new way to construct garments so we i try to to build up a system which can be individually um, configured for different parameters and then uh, put together like a little puzzle into new product and it's uh, yeah, I'm still working on this this idea. What are the challenges there, or what's the? Yeah, it's a uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But um, it's uh, it's more like a fun challenge that it's uh, the yeah, it's uh, just a difficult thing which I am not used to because it's a lot of calculation and a lot of things, mathematics, but. Um, yeah. Mm. I was thinking of, of new models or new ways uh, in relation to um, affordable fashion. Uh, do you think you will see uh, new price models? Uh, I was just heard for uh, there was a company in Gothenburg who was experimenting with the price model pricing clothing as airplane tickets. So uh, cheapest, cheaper in the beginning and, and absolutely most expensive in the end. <laughs> Do you think price, uh, different price models could be a way to, could we see that in the future? Now we have, we're used to the sales and we have mid-season yeah. sales and we, and if you go to an online store, it's hardly not worth buying it on a Monday because in two weeks time, you probably get at least 15% or, or mm. 20% use. Yeah, it's already the other way around, isn't it? If you compare to the flight yeah. <laughs> tickets. Uh, I don't know, I, I hope so. It's, uh, yeah, it's uh, kind of, uh, it's not a great system we have with things go on sale so rapidly in to the season, you know, you, you hardly, it hardly becomes winter or summer before the sale is on. So I hope so, but uh, I don't know. But I mean, there are also, uh, if we talk about development, you know, there's also plenty of room for new business models, new ideas when it comes to how, how you consume and how you, how you approach fashion in general. I mean, you can, there are, leasing models, there are swapping ideas, you know, there's so many different things going on right now where you see how you can um, achieve a new wardrobe every season without mm. purchasing or maybe purchasing a smaller clothes. Do you think renting, renting garments is a, is a way? Yeah, renting garments could be a way, absolutely. I think, yeah. I think we have to look into all different models. I'm, I'm sure the smartest models we haven't even thought about yet. We have something we, that we call the Global Change Award, which is run by the H&M Foundation. And basically it's a competition, it's the second year we're running it right now, uh, for um, uh, participants from anywhere really. It's, as long as you're not a company, you can enter the competition. And last year it was about um, uh, circular materials, 
and we had lots of interesting contributions or applications. And the winners, we had five winners that got to share a million euros that was uh, funded by the h &M Foundation and the family person then who funds this foundation. And uh, one uh, applicant had an idea about, uh, which is also now scaling up, about creating fabric out of citrus peel to the remnants from the orange juice industry in Sicily. And another one was creating a microbe called the polyester digester, polyester digester, it's hard to say, where you can uh, recycle polyester in a much more efficient way and so on. So there were lots of interesting ideas. And this year we're scaling it up a little bit. And we're also, n we're not just donating money to them, we're actually also putting them into an accelerator program together with ourselves, with the uh, Royal Institute of Technologies of Korti Ho in Stockholm and Accenture. So they get a whole year of kind of mentorship and uh, developing their idea, uh, starting up the business uh, also. So it's a great thing. This year we're also uh, including um, circular business models and circular processes um, in the application process. So it will be very interesting to see what comes has up this year. Has the final date for application, is that over or is it still uh, open? No, it's still going. It's still going. It's the end of this month. Okay. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, yeah I, I can help. So now, and now we know it works also. So, <laughs> Please feel free. Don't be Swedish. <laughs> yes? Yay, a question. Hello. I wonder for the H&M, when you collect the used garments, from every branch all over the world, how do you combine it? What kind of logistic do you use for combine those use garments? And how many percent are they, how to say, be recycled? And how many percent they are used as the secondhand clothes or charity? Mm -hmm. So uh, about 60% is used as secondhand or vintage. Uh, so they're being reworn, basically. and. Uh, it's a smaller percentage that is being recycled so far. The most, and then we have around maybe 30% or something that is being reused. The recycled part is small, but that's also why we run um, competitions like the Global Change Award. We're looking for better recycling opportunities, basically. At the moment, we can only recycle mechanically from, uh, as opposed to chemically uh, through this process. And we can only recycle uh, pure materials. So that's why the collections that we have now, that we call a closed loop collection in our stores, are denim collections because it's, they come from kind of uh, simple 100% cotton jeans. Um, but there are plenty of uh, interesting initiatives on their way. And also, um, we invest uh, with the revenue that we get from our garment collecting initiative when we hand them over to ICO, our partner. We also invest most of it apart from a part that we uh, donate to charity into uh, recycling technology innovation, basically. Uh, and we also have we also have another interesting initiative called um, One Again that we are running together with Caring, uh, which is about uh, recycling blended materials. So uh, we're looking at maybe around 2018 to be able to start launching those. I hope. The technology is all about technology, really, uh, when it comes to the. And creativity, of course, uh, design creativity. But uh, a lot of it has to do with techno technology. So I think in the future, of course, we will be able to use all waste as a resource. And we also have to get used to, to recycling our clothes and everything else too. Even the water, everything will probably end up recycling if we grow at this rate on the planet, the population. I think we have another question. Yeah, thank you. I have a question for H&M. You said that you were trying to raise the living wages in your production countries. Won't that affect uh, the long-term prices in clothes, in clothing? Not really. I mean, it's not. It's not only about. I mean, for from our part, we would be more than happy to. Um, we want. To, we also. The goal is that by 2018, all the textile uh, 
uh, workers within our uh, strategic supplies, which are the ones that produce most of our garments, should earn a fair living wage. Uh, obviously, we don't own the factories, um, but we work with all these suppliers on, on, uh, on a regular basis, but they also supply other brands, so it's kind of an industry issue, really. But the way we work with our fair living wage program is that we take a holistic approach, uh, working together with the factory owners, the trade unions, the government. So our CEO would go out to Cambodia and, uh, and Bangladesh, for instance, once a year to negotiate with the prime minister about um, annual wage revisions and minimum wages. And the textile industry is one of the very few industries that has a win minimum wage in these countries. Uh, and then we we'll also invest in uh, in the workers' uh, skills development so that they can also um, get a better job and earn a better wage uh, with, with, um, with, a, with, with more, in, in, um, what should I say, more advanced skills, basically, and also in social dialogue so that they also can put their voice uh, forward to the factory management. And basically all, all uh, working teams within the factories have to um, uh, select a workers representative that will communicate with the factory management. So it's a very kind of, uh, it's a long term vision because obviously they have to, uh, we can't negotiate wages for this, uh, for these employees, they have to do it themselves for the future. So it's important to strengthen them and make it possible for them to, to do this also in the future, not only during these years that we are running the fair living wage program. But it's good because it's scaling up and we see that uh, also from our part we are for instance uh, buying in low peak periods so our purchases are not affecting over time for instance which is also an important part so we see that after the first year where we took 100% capacity in a few role model factories to test these uh, methods um, pro productivity went up and also factory management and the workers were much happier because obviously uh, the stability uh, kind of entered into these work processes. And also, of course, uh, working very closely with the trade unions to, to ensure freedom of association and collective bargaining, which is also important for the long term. Do we have room for one more question, Clemens, from down here? Yeah, I think so. Hello. Um, one more question for Katarina. Uh, because you mentioned longevity as, a, uh, as an objective uh, that is uh, important to address. And right now, you're, I mean, you're, you're teaching the consumers to uh, not throw away their, their clothes, and, and that's a good thing. But uh, what do you think uh, H&M, I mean, the next step for H&M, and, and if we look like 10 years from now, how, how do you think that H&M will work We'll be working to, to uh, support longevity of clothes. I mean, beyond using uh, good materials in the beginning. Uh, do, you, do, you, do you understand my question? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, I understand what you mean. No, I think, but, uh, but as I said, I think it's really important that we think about it from a design perspective also, is that we create clothes that have uh, longevity also in the design. So for instance, we call them fashion essentials, which means basically, it's a more fancy name for basics, fashion basics. We, in, we uh, focus a lot on, on great basics. So the idea is that you should be able to wear your, you know, I, I always, this might look a little bit fancy, but I mean, this is kind of my style. I would probably wear this in 10 years time also. So it's, it's about finding your own style and kind of, um, and building up a, a wardrobe of, uh, of uh, not classics, but basics or essentials as we call them. And obviously for us, it's, uh, it's also about focusing on those in the while designing the collection, which we are doing uh, to a great extent. We have big departments now that we call H&M Basics. Uh, also, um, in our general collections, we, we focus a lot on these garments that, uh, that we feel have design longevity. Is that, was that, uh, does that make sense, talking about design longevity? Absolutely. Absolutely. But do do you think uh, you, you will like include uh, like extended um, an extended value proposition, for example, like um, services in a way, or 
yeah, you, you mentioned like leasing and renting and, and everything. Do you, do you think it would be realistic for you to work with those things? I think we will have to look at all different options for the future. I mean, we are a, a growing company and, and uh, the world population is, we're going to be two more billion in, in only 35 years on this planet. So obviously, I mean, we have to look at all different uh, solutions to provide all these people with, I mean, foremost food. <laughs> then we have to, you know, we, I don't even know co if cotton will be, we say that, yes, of course, we will have more sustainably uh, sourced cotton by 2020, but then again, it takes a lot of land area to grow cotton, so we probably have to think of alternatives anyway, like, for instance, we, there's material called um, monocell, which is made of bamboo, which is the fastest growing species on Earth, that you can make materials that look very similar to cotton from. I mean, it's solutions like that I think we have to think of. But also lots of other things, like maybe renting schemes. I don't know, this is not in the pipeline at all, but I would imagine if you look, you know, another 30 years, then we'll probably have to to be uh, even more creative. Mm, there's time for one more final question. Yeah. In the white shirt. Thank you. I uh, have a question for Mariko. Uh, do you ever feel like uh, constrained uh, because you are really doing designs of, of old clothes? Uh, you have your design space are, are limited or constrained in some way. Do you feel uh, creativity? Are your creativity limited in some way, or, or does you do you do you like that, or how do you work with that? Um, yeah, um, actually, the from the beginning, design is all about constraint. It's uh, my feeling. It's uh, you have this giving structure, and then you have to work of it, work the best out of it. And it's uh, sometimes it's like you have to finish your design in in next few hours, or you have to make something from uh, recycled materials, or where you have to make something for um, men between uh, 15 year old and 19 year old or anything, it, there is always constraint. And but for us or for me, it's easier even to have this kind of constraint because if it's like it's not like you can do everything and you can have your imagination and all the fantasy to make better product and uh, and for us it's the great help to have this kind of structure that we are with the, our company is based on this idea of recycling and using this given clothes so it's more a help than the hindrance Thank you. I think we conclude the session with that. And I have just one final thing to do. And it's to thank you. And uh, we're very happy again that you're here and that you um, came here to share your thoughts. And obviously it's an ongoing, it's a big topic, an ongoing discussion. But anyway, hopefully one step further in that one. So, um, Katarina, here's wow. a, you have given a gift to the World Wildlife Fund. Oh. Thank you. And Marco, to you as well, thank you very much for thank coming here. Also a gift. Great, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you uh, so much, uh, Katarina, Mariko and Clemens for this in-depth conversation and discussion on sustainable fashion. Thank you. Uh, and uh, we will now move on to the next section of our program uh, this afternoon. Uh, it's time to present our Sustainable Development Scholarship Awards. And therefore I welcome Birgitta Paulsson, who is the coordinator for sustainable development at the University of Burgos up on stage. And I would like to point out that without all the efforts of Birgitta, none of these awards would be in place. So please hurry up here once you're set. <laughs>
And Birgitta will start by introducing the awards, what they consist in, and then we will mo move on to giving out the prizes. Okay, I'll just take a second. Uh, well, I'll start just to say a few words about our work at the university. And um, for the students to be able to meet and address the big challenges of society in their future profession and as members of the society, knowledge and awareness of sustainable devel development and its complexity is of great importance. Education is seen as the most, most important indirect impact the university has in meeting the challenges of society. The integration of sustainable development in education, strategically and systematically, is supported by a certified environmental management system. It's also supported by awards given to our teachers and students to encourage them to integrate a sustainability perspective in their activities. An assessment panel with Jenny as chairperson, also including Ilona Orvat, Liselott Jonasson, Mats Johansson, Kristina Nesen, and myself as coordinator, has evaluated the integration of sustainable development in courses, projects, and in thesis work, based on assessment criteria. And we have recommended diplomas for courses integrating sustainable development and scholarships from Sparbank Stiftes and Sjuhärad for projects with the purpose to further develop the integration of sustainable development in courses and the best thesis work within sustainable development. And now we go to the first things we have to honor. Certified courses, autumn 2016. And uh, we would like the first to say 11 nominated courses, all worth sort of honored, honoring, but just five courses found to fulfill the criteria and uh, will receive diplomas. And I just want to mention before we start the ceremony in this aspect, 25 courses we now have receiving, that have received diplomas, and we are very proud of that. And the certified courses start with Aesthetics Theory Design Seminarier, Et, and we would like to welcome Emma Felt. Here she comes. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, yes, you can stand here. And uh, we, I just want to give you the motivation uh, before you receive this nice <laughs> diploma. And I also say in the name of the, the course in English, Aesthetic Theory Design Seminars 1. The content and objectives of the course syllabus express a clear and comprehensive perspective on sustainable development and an interdiscipli interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary perspective on the subject. The objectives are clearly stated and emphasize students' responsibility to formulate their own ethical approach and to pro problematize competing perspectives and conflicting objectives within the area. The integration of sustainable development also emerges clearly in the ex examination task. The stated coursework reflects a high degree of student activity and responsibility and shows that students are given the opportunity to, ve to develop a reflective approach to design practice and the design discipline from a sustainability perspective. <laughs> Definitely. And this is my part. <laughs> there you go. Thank you so much. And 
the next course is clinical nursing, general nursing, and we welcome Eva Fransson and Teja Fredenlund. Hey. And this is Teja. Welcome. Okay, and you stand there. I'll just read the motivation. The objectives and content of the course syllabus reflect both a clear and comprehensive perspective on sustainable development in relation to health, as well as care ethics, positions and dilemmas within general nursing. The examination tasks show that sustainable development is a common theme in the course, and the students are given many opportunities to reflect on their subject and their professional role from a sustainability perspective. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, the next is Organizational Sustainability and Management Within Care. Agneta Kulén Engström. It's not here, or? There she is. Wow. <laughs> And we have another person too. You are? Agneta. Nice to see you. Maria And you are also involved in the course. So you are both welcome. Yes. Yes. Okay. Uh, and here is the motivation. The objectives and content of the course syllabus reflect a comprehensive perspective on sustainable development, critical evaluation of ethical questions within the subject area and the profession as well, as approaches to equality and sustainability are clearly present. Course literature connected to sustainable development is extensive and the examination tasks require reflective reasoning based on students' own experiences. Very good. Congratulations. I don't know which one. To Thank you. Congratulations. And the next course is IT service management, and I welcome Hannes Goebel. And the motivation is, the objectives and content of the course syllabus reflect a clear and comprehensive perspective on sustainable development, which is also reflected in the solid groundwork appearing in the nomination grounds. IT service management addresses, reflects upon, and problematizes from a sustainable development perspective. Particularly, particularly commendable is that students will reflect upon conflicting goals in the perspectives of organizations, effectiveness, and sustainability. Very good. <laughs> there you go. Congratulations. And yet another course. Preschool Educational Perspectives, Children's Science and Technology, Regina Enedal and Lotta Wank. Welcome. <laughs> and the motivation. The course syllabus has goal formulations and content descriptions in line with established criteria. It's clear from the obje objectives that students will evaluate and consider how different pedagogical choices can contribute to more sustainable action in both the professional ro role and the pedagogy. Problematizing based on economic, social and ecological dimension is rela in relation to the subject are addressed in both the objectives and the coursework. 
The instruction methods reflect a high degree of student participation and interaction among students. Congratulations. Congratulations. And next area, and now we come to uh, projects that are given scholarships from Sjöhärdad. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, and uh, the scholarship, good examples, is scholarship from Sparbankstiftelsen Sjöhärdad for the further development of previously certified sustainable development courses. And the winner is scholarship awarded to Pilotprojekt, Introduktionsmoment i hållbar utveckling. Och jag hälsar Mikael Lövström välkommen upp som får ta emot detta. Ja. The pilot project in English, the integration of a university-wide introduction to sustainable development in a certified course. And uh, Daniel Jelbgren and Basim Maklofi is sort of uh, more, more responsible for this area, but Mikael is here to pick the big check. Take the money. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and uh, the course component will be integrated in the certified course organizational design and recipes given during 2017. For a total of 220 students during the first year out of four and four different educational programs at two faculties. The purpose is to provide students with an introduction to the concept of sustainable development as a basis for fur further progression. After the pilot project and its follow-up, the course component will success successively be integrated into all educational programs. A university-wide introduction to sustainable development early in the educational programs creates the possibilities for increased quality in the integration of sustainable development in relation to subject and profession later in the ed education. The pilot project also contributes to collaboration across faculty and subject boundaries. Positive as well is that the web-based course component can be used for continuing and professional development for instructors and other staff. And congratulations. And there it's you go. 60,000 Swedish crowns. <laughs> and finally, but not least, I would say, thesis work integrating sustainable development and scholarships from Sparbankstiftelsen Sjöhärad. And we have six nominated theses first. I will give a little bit extra information after the six. And they are construction of CSR, klädföretags agerande Construktion, ska, sorry, konstruktionen av CSR, klädföretags agerande efter institutionella logiker, Daniel Palmberg, regeringens krav på hållbarhetsrapportering, en studie av hur företag inom kläd- och bankbranschen kan påverkas, Karin Salevik och Demet Savuran, Environmental impacts of food waste in a life cycle perspective, a case study in a Swedish supermarket, Pedro Luz Brancoli. FRP connectors for composite facet elements, shear properties and sustainability aspects. Delge Ahmed and Alexander Olivia Rivera. Oliva Rivera. Distriktsköterskan roll vid tobaksavvänjning ur ett hållbarhetsperspektiv. Elin, Jamali, Sade och Josefine Nadolski. 
och distriktsköterskans upplevda stress i förhållande till arbetssituationen. And I also like to add that we had another two nominations uh, and it was bachelor's uh, essays in the teacher education. And the, re as the, the requirement is that it should be on advanced level. They are not, unfortunately, being in sort of the position to get uh, being taken, sort of uh, being a part of this. But we think it's a very welcome thing to do and we have thought about considering this for the next year. Mm. And I think all of these, the six and the two nominations are worth, an, worth applause for being honored and picked by the faculties being the best thesis in the three faculties. So applause for all of them. But it's just one winner, or the winner is... Construction shared first prize. Shared first prize to Konstruktionen av CSR, klädföretagsagerande efter institutionella logiker, Daniel Palmberg. Och Environmental Impacts of Food Waste in a Life Cycle Perspective, a case study in a Swedish supermarket of Pedro Luz Brancoli. And they will receive 25,000 Swedish crowns each. And you are both welcome up. So I read the motivation for each of you. Uh, the construction of CSR, apparel companies acting upon institutional logics. Thesis work by Daniel Palberg. This thesis explores the institutional logics in apparel companies construction of CSR, so, uh, corporate social responsibility, by analyzing the company's reports around CSR. The study shows that the institutional logics that the construction of CSR proceed from have the same complex and, at times, opposing characteristics as the greater world in which apparel companies exist. This, the th thesis work is of a high academic level and contributes to the subject's development through the explicit identification of power relationships using texts as empiric, empiric material. The study illuminates how sustainable development in terms of CSR is addressed in practice, and moreover, the study increases the visibility of the need for a moral dimension of CSR. This moral dimension includes the necessity of companies having a responsibility beyond their own organization. Congratulations. Congratulations. And next. The environmental effects of food waste from a life cycle perspective by Pedro Luz Brancoli. Annual food waste globally, according to data from 2013, is 1.3 million tons, while 795 million people on Earth suffer from malnutrition. This thesis addresses an aspect of this global problem in a case study. Investigating the extent of the food waste and its environmental, economic and social effects. Questions regarding the three aspects of sustainable development are discussed and problematized. Food waste produced over one year at a supermarket in Borås, divided into product groups, is quantified in terms of mass, environmental effects, and costs. A series of efforts aimed at reducing food waste extent are suggested, including alternative waste management. The results also indicate that the problem cannot be solved without increased awareness and behavioral changes on the part of both personnel and consumers. 
The thesis contributes to a deeper understanding and practical application of theoretical knowledge that can support store personnel and consumers to reduce the amount of food waste in the future. Congratulations. Congratulations. And I just, before we give a applaud for both scholars, stipendia, what do you call it? Yeah, stipendiates, yeah. Stipendiates, yes. Uh, I just want to add a little bit interesting because Pedro's thesis is also part of a project financed by Sparmark Stifters and Sju Härad called Identifying Hot Spots in Urban Waste. So I just think it's very nice that it's very good. Okay, big applause for both of you. <laughs> okay, and uh, thank you, Birgitta, and thank you. Uh, <laughs> for pushing this university always further on on the road of sustainable development. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and this is actually uh, the conclusion uh, of this part of the Days of Knowledge. And I think that we should emphasize, as Birgitta also did in a very nice way, that we should be very proud that we have both teachers and students who are not only uh, doing academic work of high quality, but that are, is also increasingly relevant from a sustainable development perspective. This is really something that the university as a whole should be very proud of. And I think that we should conclude by thanking uh, all the participants, the audience who's been here listening to us, and again, congratulate our award winners. And finally, I would like to, to remember something that I usually forget, and that is to thank the people who have been working behind the scenes. Ani and Anna uh, are two examples. There are several more who have done lots of work uh, in order for this event to be organized in such a nice way. So thank you. And we'll see some, some of you at dinner tonight. And the rest of you, I hope you go out from this room feeling happy and, and confident that we are moving steadily towards a more sustainable future. Thank you. Got your body on my mind, on it back. Just the thought of you gets me so high, so high.